We want to say greetings to everyone. And, uh, <laughs> starting too early. Hmm. We thank you all for okay. thank you all for joining us on this day, and uh, it's always a pleasure for us to bring you the word of the Lord concerning family and uh, what God's perfect will is for family. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden, and I have standing on the side of me uh, my lovely wife, Sister Antoinette Bolden. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we have quite a few things uh, we're going to cover tonight. All right, so if you have your Bible, let's go to the seventh chapter of the book of Micah. We pray that uh, something will be said that can that can help you, and uh, we hope that when we show you this in the Word. Uh, these things in the word that you will take heed and uh, that you will remember them you see that you will remember them uh, when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ uh, according to him we have to take up our cross and follow him daily you see take up our cross that means that we have to be dead to this life and that means that we're going to do some suffering along uh, the path in this life. And not only in our everyday life as far as ministry goes and as far as uh, our social life, you know, on our job or, or whatever, but also in our home. Uh, part of our cross, bearing our cross, has to do with our home as well. And that's what God wants us to understand. We would like to think that the people that say they love us, that the people that we call a biological brother or sister because we grew up in the same home, we would like to think that <clears throat> our own siblings and sometimes our own spouses uh, is our best friend. But that's not always the case. You see, we would like to think that. Uh, but that's not always the case. And so the Lord wants us to be wise according to his word and understand what his word says about it. Amen. Amen. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate. We've mentioned this on several occasions at different times about, you know, this doctrine that's preached that, you know, Christians somehow think that they don't have to go through anything, you know, um, that we're above suffering. Um, but, of course, we know the word tells us that, you know, Christ suffered and we should... Um, arm ourselves likewise and that we should be willing to go through some things and knowing that um, when we look at the victory in Christ mm -hmm. and knowing that we're victorious in Christ we have to know that you know as long as we have an enemy we're going to have a war on our hands mm -hmm. and there are going to be some obstacles along the, on, along the way there's going to be some adversity there's going to be some persecution there's going to be um, there's going to be suffering mm -hmm. um because there is a war going on. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, if we understand that there's going to be suffering, we understand that some um, difficulties are going to come. The question is, are we preparing ourselves for those times? That's right. You know, are we going to um, be prepared when we go to war? Mm -hmm. Basically. Uh, amen. And none of us want to think, you know, that way about our homes, about our siblings and people that are close to us you see but you have to remember uh, if if somebody that you don't know have never seen before maybe but maybe you work with them or something like that if they say something ugly to you or do something towards you you're not going to take it to heart now it might bother you just a little bit but you're not going to take it as personal as you would as if somebody who's close to you, I mean close to your heart, have said the same thing, you see. Why? Because you care about what those, the people who are close to you, think about you. You care about how they feel about you. Now, somebody just out in the street or at work or, you know, wherever, 
you, you may not give it a second thought about what they think about you. You can live your life, what you know, uh, <laughs> with the ability of never seeing them again. But someone that's close to you, you see, the the closer you are to someone, the deeper the wound is when they when they hurt you. Now, just like you understand that principle, the devil understands it as well. You see. Let me say something. The devil didn't need a third of God's angels to rebel. He could have rebelled all by himself. He's the devil all by himself. What was the purpose of him recruiting God's angels? To hurt God. God created them. Now if it wasn't bad enough that he rebelled, he thought, the more people I get, the more angels I get to rebel against me, the more I'll hurt God. See, so it wasn't about, you know, uh, I, I need this many if I'm going to have a chance to win over against God some kind of way. It wasn't about that at all. You see, you want to meet the, the hardest, meanest person in the world, you'll see the most hurt person in the world. People are hard and mean because they've been hurt and they put a shell around that hurt, you see. And and that's the way it is, you see. So when it comes to us as humans, even in this war with the devil that, that we have, we're not, um, the devil isn't concerned with as much with people going to hell with him as he is about hurting God that we were made in the image and likeness of God and that God has to allow by his sovereign grace and mercy has to allow us by his by our own free will to make a choice to spend an eternity away from him you see that and so through hurt the enemy tries to, to get at God and really, we're just pawns, you see. And so when, when people are not living for God, that's one more notch in the devil's belt. That's just one more person created in the image of God that's rebelling against the very one that created them. And so the devil rejoices, not because he has one more person on his side, but because he knows that hurts God. God doesn't want... It's not God's desire for any of his creation to spend an eternity away from him. You see. And so the same thing goes on when we're talking about in the homes. Whether it's between husband and wife or whether it's between children and, and you know, uh, parents or whether it's between siblings. The devil will use that sibling or that spouse or those children or parents. To hurt you because he understands the concept of I can hurt you in your heart by the people that's close to your heart. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I can hurt you that way. That, that's the reason why he chose Judas. He didn't choose somebody that was outside of the camp as much, you see. It took somebody on the inside of the camp of the Lord Jesus Christ to betray him. And the devil understood that. Amen. So, and God wants us to be prepared, you see, just like my wife was saying earlier. He wants us to be prepared for war when it comes to that. Amen. And I, I just wanted to kind of comment on something he said about, you know, um, some of the meanest people are those who are hurt and who are guarding themselves. And it just, I just quickly made me reflect on how I used to be, you know, and I wanted to share that, that one of the, one of the dangerous things about um, in case in that hurt, um, is that oftentimes it can become a part of you. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking from experience because I can remember, um, probably most of my life, you know, before I was saved and, you know, probably shortly after that too. Um, because it took the Lord really working some things out in me to really clean all of that out of me that, um, I was very, um, I was very hard. Um, and I had a lot of anger in me, and one of the dangerous things is that is when people think, I'm okay, you know, I'm not angry, 
I'm not hurt, you know, I'm not bitter about anything. I'm I'm really okay, you know. I go on day to day. And a lot of times we can fool ourselves into mm-hmm. thinking that we're okay because that's the easy way to cope with it. Mm-hmm. Because it keeps us from going back to the root of whatever that anger is or the root of whatever that hurt is, whatever the bitterness is, wherever it came from, it keeps us from going back to the root of it. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as we talked about, like we build these walls around ourselves Mm -hmm. because in my mind, I thought I'm keeping myself from being hurt. So I didn't let people get too close to me. I didn't get too close to people too quickly. And in the process of you encasing yourself and trying to protect yourself with this wall, you're just keeping out a whole lot of people that really could be loving you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're missing out on a whole lot. And, and, and again, you're still holding on to all the things, you know, all that hurt and anger and all of that that makes you that mean person. And so, you know, I just, like I said, I just kind of reflected on that briefly. And I just felt like the Lord wanted me to bring that out. That, you know, if we're going to prepare for this war, this spiritual war that we're in, we can't allow... Um, that avenue for the enemy to come in and use us in that manner Mm -hmm. and what I'm saying is that we know that the enemy has to use somebody close to us you know if he's going to get to us Mm -hmm. but one thing that could kind of magnify that is if we're already holding on to other hurt and things and bitterness that we haven't dealt with from the past Mm -hmm. and so we have to be really careful that we allow the Lord allow the Lord to deal with us with that because um, everything that we do Everything that we see, it'll all be filtered through that. Mm-hmm. And so even if a person does something that might um, rub us the wrong way, it might, be, it might be magnified based on some other hurt or bitterness or anger that we're already holding, you know, from something in the past. And so we have to be um, really careful because, um, like I said, that in itself can be an avenue for the enemy to um, use that past hurt. In current situations to, you know, just cause, um, I guess, cause problems to be magnified and to catch us off guard so mm-hmm. that we're not really um, ready and prepared to fight, you that's know, in this right. war. That's right. Amen. And so that's very important that we allow God to heal us from those past hurts. And you know what happens? It, it's a catch-22 situation. Let me tell you what I mean. When you you get hurt. Because a lot of times you've given your heart to somebody or you've allowed people to get close to you. And, of course, now let me make this clear. Anybody that love you at some point or another, they're going to hurt you. Now, perfect love does not equal no hurt at all. <laughs> you see? So That's let's right. just put that out there. People that love you, if if, you see... If you didn't love them, if they weren't close to you and you weren't close to them, they wouldn't be able to hurt you. You you make a decision to to love people and to give people a chance and and allow them to get close enough to you to hurt you. Now, whether they do it or not, you see, those occasions arise in, in different ways, you see. But we have to train our minds. That when we love people and when we allow people to love us, that that door is open for hurt. You see, to be have our feelings hurt. Somebody's gonna say something the wrong way. You see, and you you have to make up in your mind. You know, when God created this world and put people in it, He didn't create them to tiptoe around me. And what I mean is, we all have our own issues, our own things. You see. Some people get their feelings hurt when somebody give them a wrong look or something. Now, me personally, I, I don't care, you know. Don't care how you look at me, I, you know. But some people, you just destroy their whole day, <laughs> you know. And uh, and so what I'm saying is we all got those things on the inside of us, you know, that that we expect. Now, here's the key. Because... Of, Of our own expectations. We set ourselves up. For unnecessary bitterness. Because of hurt. I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you said that. 
And we don't want we don't want to allow people to be human. You know, and this this word tells us things in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, and, and so in and, and I'm just paraphrasing it. Don't get upset when you hear somebody saying something about you because you know you said some things about other people. How many of us remember reading that in the book of Ecclesiastes, you see? In other words, don't get offended when you hear folks just, you know. But what happens is our expectations of people are high. Mm -hmm. Higher than what we've set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We want people to be able to get over what we've done. So what? You know, you're supposed to be a Christian? Forgive. <laughs> Ain't you saved? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to us, we have been hurt to our soul. In some kind of way, God is going to have to avenge that. <laughs> you know, we quick to sit God on people when it's us that's been hurt, you see. But we have to extend that same mercy to, to others. But it's because of our own expectations. And so when you're talking about siblings... In fact, let's, let's read the seventh chapter of the book of Micah. And uh, we're going to start reading in verse, at verse 5. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Read that last part again. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Does everybody see that? Your biggest enemies are going to be the people in your own household. Now, Jesus, when he, when he came to this earth, he quoted this same scripture. A man's foes are those of his own house, you see. He, he quoted the same scripture now. So why does it surprise us when this comes to pass? When it happens? God, everything, it, the kind of life that, that we're going to live as Christians, God have already laid it out right here in his word. So that you're not caught off guard. He told you what it takes to follow him. That you have to love him more than you love your own self. And anybody else for that matter. Okay. You see that? So he lays it all out for us about what he expects. And what, what's going to take place when we get saved. And so I'm going to tell you what gets us caught off guard. Let's go real quick to the 17th chapter of the book of Proverbs. And we'll, we'll get there. Seventeenth chapter of the book of Proverbs. We're going to read verse 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loveth how? At all, at all times. But what? A brother is born for adversity. Born for comp competing against you. Now let's read Proverbs, the 18th chapter, and verse 24. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Does everybody see that? So, what is it <clears throat> that throws us off uh, after we get saved? <clears throat> what is it that makes us think life is really good? And now that I'm saved, people are going to love the new me. What is it that makes us think that way? Because when we are born, we're not born living for God. And when you're not living for God, the people that, that are in the world, including your siblings, are, are like this with you, close to you. You don't have as much adversity 
before you start living for, for the Lord. Now, you're going to have some adversity, but most of that is what you've brought on yourself before you start living for the Lord, you see. And so you're used to relationships just flowing. People, you, you see, you, you get along better with people, it seems like, before you get saved. That's because you had a lot in common with them. You were walking in the same darkness they were walking in. You might not even have the same habits. Have you noticed that people out in the world seem to, in the world seem to get along a lot better than people in the church? Why? Why is that? Because you, you, have, you can have somebody that drink, and then you can have this person that does this, that, but don't drink. They're going to get along well. Why? Because there's no light there to expose darkness at all. It's all dark. So in your mind, what's, what's, you know, there's no difference between me and this person. You know, when you're not saved, it's just everybody's the same. Everything is everything. We're all in the same boat. And so you don't have any adversity when you're out in the world together. Whether it's your spouse, you know, whether it's your children or whether it's your siblings, whatever the case may be, you don't have any, any adversity like that. In other words, the, when you do have adversity out there, when you're out in the world, it's not because it's spiritual. Now, so when you get saved, that's when the devil kick in. That's when the spiritual adversity kick in, you see. But before then, it's just, okay, you said something bad about me. That's okay. We can, you know, we can move past this. And you just go on. Folks in the world just go on, you see. People, a lot of people that, that are not saved, they get married and they can be married for 50 years because they're both content with being outside of God's will. No problem. We just, just keep moving on, you see. But after you get saved, the Spirit of God comes on the inside of you. And it exposes darkness. And that Spirit reproves lies. That Spirit of truth reproves the lies that people live on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you don't ever have to have words against or uh, with people. You don't ever have to, you know, have a disagreement. The spirit on the inside of them disagrees with the spirit that's on the inside of you. And that's enough for adversity to take place. As you've heard me say before, when I was in college, uh, there was a couple of guys. We were in class together. And uh, they would go to lunch together. Now, we would be in class. We would be talking in class. But... It was like they didn't want me around when they went to lunch or anything like that. And uh, I remember one day I was sitting in my car eating my food and uh, just pretty much having a pity party. Lord, nobody, why is it that nobody want to be around me, you know? And the Lord just straightened me up real quick and said, it's not you, it's me. It's not you that they don't, that they dislike. It's me that's living on the inside of you. They don't feel comfortable around you. Now that's all that is. And so you have to look at it that way. Now what gets us all hurt is when we take it personal. When we stand in God's place. Same thing Samuel did. The people came to Samuel saying uh, we want a king just like the other nations have to lead us going in and coming out. And Samuel went to God. Well, Depressed and upset that the people wanted the king, and God asked them, "Why are you? Why are you upset? It's not you they're rejecting. It's me. I'm their king. They're wanting to replace me." You see, and so what we have to do is take ourselves out of that equation when we're talking about adversity. What's really going on? Let me just just put it in in regular everyday terms. When you're playing checkers or when you're playing chess, 
and you win. Let's say, of course, it takes two people to play either one of those games. Or tennis, or anything like that, where you got one against the other, and one person win. Of course, only one person can win. The, 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 the chess piece that played the last move, you're not giving that piece credit for winning. You're not saying, oh, I had, I had a good racket, and that's why I, you know, the, so the racket, I'm giving all the credit to the racket. And what you have to realize is that you're just a chess piece in this war. Does everybody understand? If you belong to God, th then you're God's piece that he's moving around that board. And the people that's coming against you, they're a piece of the devil. That the devil is moving. But it's by no means meant for you to include yourself in on it. Like, God, woe is me. I'm just taking all of it, Lord. Oh, I know I'm going to have me a crown in heaven when I'm done. <laughs> Who is it that's really playing, making the moves? The Bible says... That the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Now, if you're leading yourself, then you stand in there and you take credit for, for what you're doing and for people coming against you. But when God is leading you, in other words, God is moving you across the board, you see, then you have to make sure that you put God and keep God in his proper place. You see, and, so, and that's the way you have to look at it. You don't take it personal. Because the devil is using somebody that's close to you. You see. You have to look at first. The devil is using them. And so if the devil is using them. Then why on the earth is he coming against me. Of all the people in the universe. Is it really about me? Or did this war start before I was ever thought of? Mm -hmm. You see. And that will help us to, to, to cope with things. Mm -hmm. And not to take it personal. Now, part of the devil's game is trying to get you to take it personal so that when the situation is over and done, you're bitter. And before you know it, you're on his side now. He, you're one of the pieces that he's moving around through your own bitterness. You see that? And so we have to be careful with that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. So let's go look... Uh, Let's go uh, to the book of Galatians now. The Bible tells us in what we just read that a friend, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know why that's the case? You're going to be best friends with your friend, best friend, a lot of times. Not all the time, but uh, most of the time before your best friends, you know, uh, you'll be closer to your best friend a lot of time than you are to your own sibling. Let me explain why. Because you didn't decide that the person that's your sibling is going to be your sibling. You had nothing to do with that. You're not siblings because God thought, oh, they'll be good sisters or they'll be good brother and sister. I'm a Go ahead and let them be born in the same family. It has nothing, to, absolutely nothing to do with, you know, God figuring that y'all will get along so he's going to make y'all brother and sister. Or sister and sister, whatever the case may be. Nothing to do with it. So a lot of times your sibling is your first friend because they're the ones that's around all the time. But the Bible says that there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In other words, a sibling. Why? Because... You choose who your friends are going to be. And a lot of times that's because of personality. You, you don't get to choose your, your sibling, but you get to choose who your friends are going to be, you see. And a lot of times if you got any sense, you, you just allow that to naturally happen. You see, you don't try to force it, you know, or anything like that. It just naturally happens. And so what we're wanting to go over now in the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Galatians, is what causes this rift in the household. It's not just because, you know, one of you want to drink caffeinated and the other one decaffeinated. 
And you have to look at it. It goes deeper than what you know, than what's the game that's being played on the surface. You see, and you have to look at it that way. Let's go. Uh, we'll start reading at verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the, under, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of he but he of the free woman was by promise. Everybody see that? One born of after the flesh, and really the other one born after the will of God, by prom the promise of God. And so when you see I don't care who it is, whether it's mama or daddy, sister, brother, friends, whoever the case may be, everybody that you'll ever see in this whole world from here to eternity fits under one of these two categories. Mm -hmm. God does not look at black and white people. He don't look at Republican and Democrat. You either saved or you unsaved. There's only two kinds of people in this world. The saved and the damned. One of them born after the flesh, the other one born after the promise of God. Now, that's, this is not talking about, you know, um, fl born after the flesh, you know, in that sense, because we're all born after the flesh when it comes to that. But what it's talking about is recognizing what part of the kingdom or, or what kingdom different individuals belong to. Now, if you identify that, first of all, first and foremost, that right there should be enough to keep you from getting your heart broken behind what people are doing. If, people, if you belong to the kingdom of God, then you automatically have the gates of hell coming against you. Hmm. Now, Jesus said it won't prevail, but it's going to come against you. So if, if you understand that, then your, it's your job to identify. Okay, I'm, I, I belong to the kingdom of God. And so if somebody don't belong to the kingdom of God, automatically by default, they belong to the kingdom of darkness. So what do you think is supposed to happen? The devil don't have neutral people working for him. The devil's not neutral. He's not going to say, well, you're, you're a newlywed, so I'm going to let y'all be married for a few years before I start kicking up dust. You just got saved, so I'm going to let you, you know, let you get used to being saved and get you some strength up before I come against you. You see that? It said that Abraham had two sons, one born by the slave and one born by his wife. One was born after the flesh, by the will of flesh, and one was born by the will of God. In other words, and it took a miracle for that one to get here. Isaac, in other words. And so if we understand that that's the case, then we should understand that there are only two kinds of people in this world. And if they don't belong to the kingdom that we belong to, then automatically we have to set this in our minds if we don't set anything else. They're in a position for the devil to use them. And not just to hurt us by looking at us funny every now and then, but hurt us deeply through the things that the devil will use them to do. We have to prepare our minds for that. It would be foolish to go to a war and to see your enemy standing there and be surprised when they shoot you. Why? You, you know you're in a war. So why are you surprised when your enemy is, is throwing bombs at you or, or whatever the case may be? And I, and I think what we get mixed up at 
is, you know, I grew up with my little sister. I can't believe they did that. What does y'all growing up together have to do with what part, what kingdom they belong to? Yeah. Are they supposed to be faithful to you just because y'all are blood kin? Oh, they're going to be faithful to their master. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. So they're going to be faithful to their master. You see that? And that's the way you have to look at it. So it's not about, oh, mama's got us on the phone and she's going to make sure that we all sit down and talk so we can all get along. <laughs> that's not going to work. You see that? The only way two people can walk, the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? The only way you can walk with somebody for any length of time is if you agree with them. I know we don't want to, you know, categorize people, you know, and I'm sure I'm going to get emails from people saying, well, that's, that sounds like judging. <laughs> that, well, you know, the Bible tells us to judge with righteous judgment. He, he don't want us to be ignorant. Jesus told his, those apostles when he sent them out, Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. He said he told them to be wise like serpents. You know what a serpent does? Especially that, that, that uh, cobra, he, and any snake for that matter, they study you. Everybody, anybody ever notice that? They don't just rise up and strike you. They looking at you. And if you're not careful, you'll think, oh, that's a, little, that's a nice little pet. Now I can take that pet home and, you know. <laughs> and the whole time they're thinking, stupid, don't you know I'm a snake? I'm about to bite you. Jesus said to be as wise as serpents, not fools, in other words. He wants you to understand what side people are on. He didn't walk this earth hurting because, you know, the Pharisees were coming against him. He didn't, you know, when they started asking him all those questions and coming against him and accusing him, he didn't think, oh, man, I thought y'all were my friends. Y'all were coming to church every time I preached and all. I thought y'all were, you know. But you know what get us off guard? We think because people have done a few things for us. We think because, you know, they we've lived under the same roof. What people have done for you does not negate the fact that they're still a part of the other kingdom there, the kingdom of darkness. It, it, you'll never get past that. I don't care what kind of counseling you go to, you'll never get past that separation, separating line there that God himself has set up. Now you have to, when you identify where people are, you better make sure that you remember where they are. Does everybody understand? And so that's what we make our mistake at, and that's what we set ourselves up for to be hurt. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I was just going to share a scripture that, you know, is like, the conclusion of you know all that you're talking about concerning you know people being in two different kingdoms and when we recognize that um and that's in ephesians chapter six and i'm just going to read um verses 10 through 12 that says finally my brethren be ye strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And um, like I said, it's just a conclusion of what you're saying, that we have to realize that um, when we take ourselves out of it and, and don't take it personal, realize who it really is fighting against us, and not just look at that person. And I like the term that um, you used a few years back that when we're able to n number one know what kingdom that person is um, in and who's using them when we can see the spiritual aspect of it um, 
then we can actually see that person as a victim also. Mm -hmm. Because anybody that the enemy is using, they're a victim of his. That's right. And he's trying to use them to victimize us. Mm -hmm. You know, to victimize Christ by, by getting them to use us. I'm going to put it that way. Um, and so instead of us just keeping it in the natural realm, like, oh, you know, my coworker spread a rumor about me. And so now I'm mad with this person. You know what I'm saying? How about seeing that person as the victim and then seeing the person who's victimizing them and be praying for that person and fighting in the spirit mm -hmm. against our real enemy? That's right. And uh, that, like, that analogy that you just used with the coworker that was, you know, backbiting against you. Well, the way to look at that is to say, my coworker is bound by an untamed tongue. Mm -hmm. You see that? But see, as long as we're making ourselves the victim, right. then we can't pay attention to the whole picture of right. what's going on. What What's the big picture? And what it does is it keeps you from making an enemy out of flesh. Right. Right. You see that? It'll keep you. That's why Jesus mm -hmm. says to pray for your enemies. It's easy to do that. Now, he had to say it that way to get you to understand what he was talking about. Really, what he was saying was to pray for the people who the devil is using to come against you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Why did he say pray for them? Because they have a soul too. Right. People are the way they are. And whether you know it or not, a lot of people don't realize. If the devil have them, they don't realize how bound they are. Some people are, don't even know they're bound. Mm -hmm. When people are on, when the devil is using people, in their mind, they're just as justified as you are. Now, you may be have the grace of God on you where your eyes have been opened and you can see clearly what's going on and why, you know, why people are doing what they're doing. But if the devil is using them, people don't go to hell because they sign a contract and make a decision to go there. They go there because they are deceived. People don't just outright just want to work for the devil. If they're being used by him, most of the time they don't even know it. You see that? And so we, we as believers, we have to know it. And we have to treat them like they don't know it. You see that? Because most of the time, I mean, you think about it. When you were out in the world, most of the time you didn't know all that stuff that you were doing. Somebody else could see very clearly how lost you were, but you couldn't see it. You might have known you weren't saved, but that's as far as it went. I'm a good person still. You know, God knows my heart. And when I get ready, I'm going to give it all to God. <laughs> but you were just as deceived. <laughs> you thought because you weren't out robbing banks, you were okay. I'm going to make it to tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to repent or whatever, you see, but. God wants you to have that same mercy with, with other people. That people are lost. They're blind. And, it, and that helps us and keeps us from being as hurt by different situations that we may find ourselves in if we'll look at it that way. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading uh, in the book of Galatians. Uh, we'll pick back up at 23, uh, chapter 4 and verse 23. But he who was of the bound woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to, to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, that thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. 
But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Everybody see that? People that are out in the world, that are close to you for whatever reason, whatever kind of relationship you have, Paul says they're going to persecute you. Go ahead and keep reading. Nevertheless, what said the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Mm -hmm. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Go ahead and read chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now let me tell you what the gist of the problem is when it comes to these adversities in our homes, friendships, or whatever the case may be. When you start living for the Lord, all of a sudden your eyes are opened where you see things that you didn't see before and you look at you're looking at it from a whole different angle mm -hmm. from a whole different perspective now you're walking by faith and walking by faith now because see that's what Isaac represented the faith son and walking by faith is alien to somebody that's out in the world. Mm -hmm. That's where the persecution come in at. Does everybody understand? So while the world is busy trying to make their own way, you're resting in God. Now that's, that, that right there is the revelation of what the true Sabbath is. Resting in Jesus Christ. We don't just rest in him on one day, pick a day and just rest and not go to work. That, that's meant to be every day. Resting in him and by faith. Does everybody understand? In other words, you're not walking around pulling your hair out, trying to figure out, you know, or trying to keep up with different people, with what they got going on financially and, and everything like that. You're walking by faith and that's something strange. That's a strange thing to somebody that's not walking by faith because their eyes haven't been opened. You, it's that, you're in two different kingdoms for a reason. Those two kingdoms operate completely different. When I was in Hong Kong, you could get arrested for, for chewing gum in public. So when I got back here, I chewed all the gum I wanted. I, I didn't think, well, you know, that Hong Kong, it really worked on me and I just got this, I just can't do it. What? Every time we pulled into a, a different country, we had a meeting where they would tell us the rules. Now, some of those countries, our country didn't have a treaty with. So if you got arrested over there, uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you see? Why? Because a different kingdom. When I... Um, first landed in Saudi Arabia, I was sitting at the airport, and uh, I'm sitting there with my legs crossed, like, and uh, I see this big commotion, you know, like a big commotion. I could tell it was about me, because everybody looking at me. And I'm just thinking, man, you know, I'd rather be in the U.S., because I didn't know what was going on. And eventually, uh, the person that came from my ship to pick me up, he told me what was going on. He said, man, you sitting there with your legs crossed now. Your toes are pointed towards this woman. And her husband don't like that. Over here, that's an insult. You might as well be cussing that lady out and doing everything else towards her. Well, I didn't know that. But see, that's a different kingdom over there. Over here, you can do it. Nobody pay attention to it. It doesn't, you know. Over there, you see, it's nothing to see two men walking down the street holding hands with their wives following behind them. That's their culture. Because that's their friend. And even Paul, you know, over there, men kiss one another on each side of their cheek. 
Not because they're gay. That's their culture. Now, Paul was a part of that culture, you see. That's why Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet your brother with a holy kiss. So that wasn't anything off the wall. And over here, over here, we sit with our legs crossed. No matter where the toes are pointed, we're not thinking, ooh, you're in trouble. You done <laughs> did it now. You about to set it off. You see. <laughs> you see. And so, different kingdoms have different rules. Now, the people in this kingdom might not understand the rules over there. But here's what you have to understand. Even if you don't understand it, you have to respect it. And many of us as believers, we don't respect that kingdom and how they operate. We think, well, you know, you're a human being. You, sp you should love the way I love. Why do you have to kick up dust like that? Well, I'll tell you why. That's because that's how that kingdom operates. Now, you have to get that in your mind. You have to know the rules of it. And so, see, and they're sitting on the other side thinking the same thing. Well, why you got to be so peaceful? Why, you know, why you, <laughs> why can't you get mad like me so I can make, I can feel better about myself? <laughs> you see, and so God wants us to understand that, that it's two different kingdoms. You see, two different people operating there. And, and you're going to look at things differently more differently than somebody else will that's a part of the kingdom of darkness. And, and, you, and to keep from being hurt, you have to decide within yourself where people are. See, and so it's not based on, well, my brother or my sister don't like me because I'm saved or whatever the case may be or because I've bought a new car, you know, because that's where the enemy is taking it now. You know, everybody all of a sudden is, is haters because I've gotten a new car. No, it's not that at all. The devil don't need any excuse to be the devil. You see that? He, he don't need any excuse whatsoever. He don't care what kind of car you drive or anything like that. He's going to be who he is. And if he if, and the people that's working for him, in other words, the people that are a part of his kingdom, he's going to use them. And you have to take yourself out of that equation. You have to remove yourself from taking it personal, to keep from taking it personal, so that you can continue to operate the way God wants you to operate. Why? Because as soon as you're looking at people and you're looking at flesh and you're thinking that that's flesh operating, your flesh is going to rise up because you're going to think, I can handle it too. I can, my, my, I can get just as loud as you can. You see, and then the doorway to that, of course, is, well, they better be glad I'm not the way I used to be because I would do this and the devil will tell you, have you gone down memory lane with it? <laughs> <laughs> you see, The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, a soft answer turneth away wrath. A soft answer. You see. And, and, and that's what God wants us to use. His wisdom. To understand what kind of war we are in. When I was overseas, uh, the, one of the main countries, I, I landed in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia. Uh, was that back in uh, March of uh, 1993, Mogadishu, Somalia, and I had never owned a gun. I had never um, been trained. You know, I was in the Navy, so I didn't know anything about machine guns or M60s or M16s or anything like that. But when I first got there, one of the first things they did, they told me, well, you know, uh, your, your ship is not here. And uh, we'll get word to you when we find out where it is, because that's where my ship was supposed to be, was in Somalia. But it wasn't there. After flying halfway around the world to catch it, it wasn't there when I got there, you know. And so they said, your ship isn't here. But here, here's an M16. This is how you take it apart. This is how you put it together. You just tote this around with you. And every morning when you get up at 6 in the morning, we're going to give you a password. And if anybody asks you what the password is, you have to be able to spit it out 
just like that because if not they can shoot you on the spot or they can bring you to the commanding officer again I knew nothing about M16s but see I was in a war zone and I, I couldn't say well look I don't want this M16 I got rocks I'm good with throwing them and uh, <laughs> in other words I had to fight in the war, I had to fight the war the way that they fought it. I had to know what kind of war I was in. Those people, it wasn't the kind of war like, okay, we're going to go, I'm going to take you to court, and we're going to figure out who's winning. No, them people were shooting people. And we had to be prepared. It didn't matter whether you were ready for it or not. That You know, I was just kind of thrust out there like that. And that's the way it is when you become a Christian. You get pushed out there. Now, you're in a war whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can't go into it thinking, you know, because I'm a lovely and peaceful person, everybody's just going to like me. It don't matter how, you know, what kind of, what kind of person they are, they're just going to like my person. I, I just got one of those types of personalities. That devil don't care how nice you are. As long as that person is yielding themselves to be used by him, they are going to be used by him. Does everybody see that? And so, Jesus, well, nobody nicer than him. But they still killed him. What make you think you're any better? <laughs> he, he didn't come here killing people. His disciples tried to get him to do it and said, Lord, do, would you have us call down fire from heaven like, like uh, Elijah did and consume these? And Jesus said, I didn't come. You don't know what kind of spirit you are of. I, the Son of Man didn't come to take lives. He came here healing people, raising the dead, and they still found a reason to kill him. In other words, it doesn't matter how nice you are, how much you're doing for people. That's what get us thrown off. We think, well, I'm, I'm nice to this person. I brought them lunch. Surely they know I'm a good person. They're not going to ever say anything bad about me. My mother told me a story that uh, before her and my daddy got married, that... Um, I guess right when they were about to get married, she wanted to go and clean up my daddy's house. They weren't living together, but she thought, I guess, you know, we're going to get married and we're going to be together. And since this is going to be my house, I'll clean it up and fix it up the way I, I want it. And so she wanted to get my daddy's niece, who was raised as his little sister, to go with her. And so she called, and, and her name was Virginia. She said, will you go over, over to Hawk's house with me and so that I can clean it? She said, because I don't want people to think that I'm in there doing things that I ain't got no business doing. So if you go with me, then people uh, you know, won't assume the worst, that he and I are in there sleeping together, whatever the case may be. Now, that was her reason for asking her that. And so my cousin responded with, now, Dolores, I'll go with you and help you, you know, and and with you over there and to clean Hawk's house. But she said, you don't ever get too good for people not to talk about you. In other words, no matter what you do to cover yourself, no matter how nice you are, people are going to find something that they don't like. That's just the nature of people. You don't ever get too good. <laughs> And we ought to know that if Jesus Christ wasn't good enough and people found fault with him, surely they're going to do the same for us, whether it's siblings, whatever the case may be, you see. And so we have to be prepared for that, mm -hmm. you know. Amen. Amen. Did you have anything? All right. Anybody have any questions or comments? Um, I had a comment. I wanted to comment on like 
one of the first things that we started talking about in regards to like people being hurt and like building up walls and stuff and that really opening the door for a whole bunch of other things to take place and it just made me think about how it's so crazy now looking back on it but it was one point in time where like I was really nice to people and so I was just like okay well since I'm so nice and people just keep taking advantage of me I'm just going to be really mean and so I built up this wall where it was like if you could get past me being mean to you then I would be nice to you and then we could be friends <laughs> but if you couldn't get past the mean part then I wasn't going to show you the the I guess vulnerable side of me and let you in and so then when I finally decided that I was going to live for God that was one of the first things that he dealt with me and, and said people shouldn't have to go on a roller coaster ride to get close to you it shouldn't be all the theatrics and the tricks and the maze to have to get close to you. That's not how it's supposed to be. And so that was one of the first things that I had to fix or allow the Lord to fix in me so that I can allow people to come in and be able to minister to me and be a blessing. Because if you really think about it, it's people that God sends to you. But if you got a wall built up, then you're going miss, to miss out on what he's trying to teach you because you got all these barrels and all this other kind of stuff blocking you from because you don't want to be hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Do we have any other questions or comments? If you're on the phone, if you have a question or comment, you can press five star. We don't have any other questions or comments. You want to close us out with a word of prayer. Okay. Lord, thank you for this word um, that has gone forth. And thank you for allowing us to gather together in your name. I pray, Lord, that um, the word that has gone forth tonight will take root in our hearts and bring forth fruit. That we will take heed to the things that you have spoken on tonight concerning um, this war that we're in. Um, and being able to take ourselves out of it and not take things personally, but to always see it um, from a spiritual perspective, know who our true enemy is, and be able to identify um, the victims of, of this war, and that we will always choose to fight spiritually and not naturally. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.